Hare Krishna, Radhika Raman Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. We are eagerly waiting for your association. Last time we had a very, very deep as well as a very illuminating discussion. So I look forward to something similar today also. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. It's always such a pleasure to be in your association, to have a conversational partner on these uh, wonderful topics. And I really appreciate the service you do to the Vaishnava community in terms of making these podcasts available. I can't tell you how many people have uh, uh, mentioned to me how much they gain from these podcasts. So I, it's, it's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be with you again here today. Thank you, Prabhu. I think the, if the podcasts have any value, it's primarily because of the devotees who come here and we discuss thoughts. So thank you for joining. So I thought last time we had discussed elaborately about broadly faith and reason, the academic and the devotional approaches to studying the tradition. So as a continuation of that, but so from a slightly different perspective, I thought of, we could discuss about hermeneutics. The, the, uh, what it is, why is it needed? The word itself can seem very unfamiliar to those who approach scripture from a traditional perspective. But for those who approach from an academic perspective, they find they feel it, it's indispensable. So it's almost a collision. What is considered indispensable is considered completely almost non-essential. But uh, it is a, it is a part of the tradition also, and understanding that is a is quite helpful in learning how to appreciate and apply scripture. So would you like to start with basically explaining about hermeneutics, what it is and why is it needed, and then we can take it forward from there? Yes, I, I think you're very right, Prabhu, that uh, the, the word itself is often the biggest barrier. Uh, and once you understand what the word means, it's actually a very, um, it's not a difficult concept to grasp. And it's something that's, uh, you know, everyone uses and uh, engages with without sometimes without realizing it. Uh, so the word hermeneutics simply comes from a Greek word, which means to express or translate or explain or interpret. Uh, and so hermeneutics usually as a field of study, it describes both the theory and the method of how to explain or interpret uh, scriptural texts, uh, any text really, but in our context, it would be the words of guru, sadhu and shastra. Uh, so that broadly speaking, that category uh, that we think of as, um, as a shabda pramana. And, uh, and so it, hermeneutics is, is to express or to translate basically, uh, or to uh, interpret. Now, the, the word interpretation is sometimes uh, a sticky point for devotees because Srila Prabhupada speaks many times. He says, we do not interpret. We take it as it is, right? Uh, and, and so um, uh, uh, we, th this word interpretation then gets a negative field for it. But usually when Srila Prabhupada is using the word interpret in a negative sense, he means to say we do not misinterpret. Uh, because in other places, uh, less frequently, but nevertheless, uh, with, in, in, in several places, he uses the word interpret in a positive sense. So, for example, in the Lila, where um, uh, the, I think it's the, the, the uh, when, when um, uh, I, I'm forgetting, I think it's when Krishna is drinking milk from uh, uh, Putana or poison, rather, uh, or when the flowers are falling off of, uh, Mother Yishwada's hair as she's running behind Krishna to catch him in Damodar Leela. Prabhupada uses the word interpret several times. He says, some acharyas interpret this to mean that this is happening and other acharyas interpret this scene like this way. And so he's describing how the acharyas are interpreting different things. So simply to say that the word is not negative in itself. Mm. Um, uh, basic point of hermeneutics is that we, hermeneutics gives us guidelines and principles by which we can understand how to properly interpret or explain Shastra and how to not misinterpret Shastra, right? So it, it's, it's just a simple, simple thing. And if the word interpret is, is, is distasteful uh, for some people, then we can simply use the word explain, 
uh, that's also fine. How to explain Shasta properly and how to ex uh, uh, not uh, improperly explain Shasta. So, yeah, uh, just uh, going back. So you said this is, we use it um, in a way that is, uh, sorry, the, the, the idea of hermeneutics is not limited necessarily to spiritual texts or scriptures. So would we have something like, say, hermeneutics for reading Shakespeare today or hermeneutics for reading uh, Homer and Iliad and Odyssey also? So is it that... Definitely. So what is the need for hermeneutics? It, it's, it's, it seems to be like almost a universal need. So is it just the difference in time and culture and context? So for example, if I read the New York Times or you read the Times of India, do we also have a hermeneutics involved in reading that? Or when something is very much within a part of our culture, then hermeneutics doesn't come in? Or is it implicit over there and in some other places it has to be explicit? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really uh, a good question, Prabhu. Uh, hermeneutics is there implicitly anytime we try to understand language. Uh, it's, uh, and, and most of the time it's implicit. Most of the time we don't need to think about it. Like reading the, the newspaper, uh, no one wants to do a hermeneutical analysis or interpretation of what's being said. Uh, we have a common sense of what these words mean in a particular context and we apply it, right? Uh, so, but, but the, the hermeneutics becomes important. It becomes a field of study uh, when we are dealing with texts whose meanings are not easy to understand and when there's significant consequences to our understanding of their meaning. And this is why every religious tradition has some sort of implicit or explicit hermeneutics in terms of understanding their sacred texts, in terms of understanding their scripture. Because in that context, every word will make a huge difference, right? Sometimes a single word can have a um, seismic impact on, on what is um, on, the, uh, on the lives of the followers, uh, on the maintenance, uh, the, the preservation of the institution. So in contexts like that, that's when hermeneutics becomes particularly important or crucial. That's when we speak about it and study it. It's there and everything. It's there even when we read the newspaper, but no one really cares about hermeneutics in such situations because the consequences are low and it's, it's a quite simple text also to understand. There's usually not a huge controversy, okay. usually. So you say complexity and consequentiality, two things would come in. Hmm? Yes. 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 Um, so in Krishna book, Prabhu, uh, in chapter six of Krishna book, was the story of Putana uh, and... Um, uh, Prabhupada says here, Krishna showed the nature of a small baby and closed his eyes as if to avoid the face of Putana. This closing of the eyes is interpreted and studied in different ways by the devotees. Some say that Krishna closed his eyes because he did not like to see the face of Putana, who had killed so many children and who had now come to kill him. Others say that Putana hesitated to take the baby on her lap because something extraordinary was being dictated to her from within. And in order to give her assurance, Krishna closed his eyes so that she would not be frightened. And yet others interpret in this way, Krishna appeared in order to kill the demons and give protection to the devotees, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Paritranaya Sadhunam Vinashaya Chadushkritam. The first demon to be killed was a woman. According to Vedic rules, the killing of a woman, a Brahmana, cows, or a child is strictly forbidden. Uh, Krishna was obliged to kill the demon Putana, and because of the killing of a woman, it's forbidden according to Vedic Shastra, he could not help but close his eyes. Another interpretation is that Krishna closed his eyes because he simply took Putana to be his nurse. So uh, we can see here, it's uh, a Prabhupada, I mean, this is a, a wonderful example of hermeneutics, right? So a single statement in Srimad Bhagavatam which says Krishna closed his eyes while drinking milk. Mm -hmm. And the eyes offer so many layers of meaning, so many interpretations of that one event. And um, this is basically the, what 
this is a, a fine example of what hermeneutics is and why it's so important and how it's actually there in everything we read, even though we may not be conscious of it. Yeah, beautiful. So, again, you would say that this is also an example of say applying hermeneutics to Prabhupada's statements. So, when Prabhupada says there's no need for interpreting, so what does he mean by that? So, the interpret we need an interpretation to understand Prabhupada's use of the word interpret. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, uh, Prabhu, before we go into further details of hermeneutics, I want to give you an example of the importance of hermeneutics uh, by using an example from the Bible. Uh, now, the reason I want to give you an example from the Bible is because uh, the um, it's sometimes a whole lot easier to see uh, something at work in a tradition that is very different from our own, right? If it's something very close to home, uh, then it's usually very uh, touchy. It's very, um, uh, it's, it's a little more um, sensitive, but we can see things in a more detached fashion when it's happening in another tradition. So this example in particular, it comes from the New Testament, uh, the gospel according to Matthew, uh, in uh, chapter five, and it's from a section called uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is Jesus is speaking to many followers in the general public and his disciples also. And it's a beautiful section in the Bible, very, very famous, where Jesus has many nice statements. Uh, one of these statements in particular, it goes like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, suppose I knew nothing about Christianity. And I, I thought, let me interpret this statement. So I took the sentence, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I thought, oh, what this means is that if I'm humble, then I can expect that when I wake up in the morning someday, I shall be king of the earth. The whole world will be mine. Now, that interpretation would be a completely uh, foolish interpretation uh, because no Christian actually believes that particular statement, right? That idea. Uh, rather, the way most Christians think of this statement is in a sense of, uh, eschatology over time, uh, that right now, at this point in history, if you, uh, um, if you uh, 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 inherit, uh, if you are humble, you, you won't rise in politics, you won't inherit anything, right? But over time, uh, it, when Jesus comes, the second coming of Jesus, when he returns to earth and everything is made proper and nice, then, and the world becomes a heavenly place. And at that time, uh, those who are humble, those who are devoted, they shall have everything at their fingertips, right? Everything shall be theirs. So um, uh, that's a typical theological interpretation of that passage. Now, to understand the passage better, to, to apply hermeneutics, uh, let's add some historical context to that statement, okay? If I give you a historical interpretation, here's what happens. When Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is happening at that time in Israel, in the Middle East? The Jews are subjugated and he is speaking to a group of people who have been harassed and subjugated by the Roman powers. And they are expecting someone to come and liberate them from that, the Messiah, the savior. And at that time, most of them are expecting someone who will lead them militarily to fight and get out of that um, subjugation, that colonization. And here is someone standing in front of them in public saying you should be humble instead. That you should turn the other cheek. If someone hits you on this cheek, 
give them the other cheek. If someone asks for your coat, give them your shirt also. The whole idea in the context of what people, the Jews are expecting is radical. And when we understand the historical context, our appreciation for Jesus's statement, it grows even more. Mm-hmm. It goes deeper, you see? It, because now we can understand that his statement is actually not just theologically, religiously very deep, but in that historical context, it was actually very, very powerful. He was taking a great risk by making a statement like this, that we have to be humble, even in the face of so much violence. And in attack. one sense, challenging the preconceptions of his audience about what role he is expected to play or what role they, Ex- think, they think he should be playing. Hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So he, he's, he's really challenging his audience. So the normal theological interpretation that most people who know the Bible would be able to give you. But if you added some historical knowledge to it, look at how it transforms your appreciation for that particular statement. Okay. So this is two. A basic inter- Well, we did a wrong interpretation. Then a basic interpretation, a religious theological one. Then we did a historical one. And they're not contradictory. I mean, the first one is wrong. But these two are not contradictory. They're just layers on top of each other, right? The historical doesn't contradict the religious one, the theological one. It just increases our appreciation for it. Now, suppose we do yet another one, okay? And this time, let's choose a slightly more radical interpretation uh, and do a Marxist interpretation of that passage. Now, as you probably know, Karl Marx was not very fond of religion, and he had a lot of criticisms of what religion does and particularly its effect on the weak, on the poor. Mm -hmm. And he sees this passage. I mean, I'm, I'm channeling him. Okay. But any Marxist thinker who sees this passage would uh, say, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you see, this is precisely what is wrong with religion. You tell the poor, you stay quiet. Oh, and make sure you're also humble. Uh, Because if you're humble in this life and you let people rule over you and you let you stay in your position, don't revolt, don't cause a revolution, don't object, don't be angry. Then in the future, in heaven, you will get get your rewards, Mm -hmm. right? So religion promises great rewards to those who are humble now. In this way, the rich and the powerful, they can keep their positions without much challenge. That's true. I think this is also what, before Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche also said the same thing. It about slave morality. And he said that is what has weakened the Western culture. And he was very critical of things. I think uh, he didn't have as much influence sociologically as Karl Marx had in terms of dismantling religious structures actually in society. Yes, yes, yes. So no, you're right. This is, this is a perennial criticism of religion uh, is, is, you know, um, it, it tries to keep people in its place. It keeps the status quo. So from a Marxist interpretation, this passage would essentially be seen as a power play of the rich to keep the poor in their position. Now, again, let's keep our focus on hermeneutics. Look at the radical change, the completely different meaning now that we have from the passage as a result of using a different hermeneutical system, different hermeneutical frame. Now I've got one more, one final example. We've done a misinterpretation. We've done a, a, a proper theological one, a basic one. We've done uh, a historical interpretation. We've done a Marxist one. Mm. And last one, let's try to salvage the statement from Marx. So uh, in, in, the, um, in a branch of Christianity, which is, uh, arose in South America, but is popular all over the world now, called liberation theology. It's mm. a form of theology that focuses on helping those who are poor and, and who are downtrodden against systemic injustice. So in liberation theology, um, they would take this statement and turn Marx's interpretation on its head. 
saying, yes, this is about the poor and the weak. But what it tells us when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He is teaching us. He is showing us how he stands along with those who are the weakest and the poorest and the most downtrodden in society. And he is instructing all Christians to stand with the poor and to make it happen that they inherit the earth. Make it happen that the poor get their fair share in our society, that they do not remain in that downtrodden. So he's giving a call to action, not a call to passivity, which is what Mark's argument was, that you have to be passive. He's giving a call to action. So just see, I just see the power of a hermeneutical system, of hermeneutical frame. A single statement, one line, can have such consequential effects on how we act as Christians. If we were Christians, it would make a huge difference in our life, right? What hermeneutical frame? So, so the point being, hermeneutics matters. Sometimes people think hermeneutics is just the, 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 the playground of intellectuals who have their head in the clouds and who have nothing better to do, uh, when in fact, things are actually really simple. But the point is, we think that it doesn't matter. It's usually because we have accepted some hermeneutical principle without really realizing that we've taken it, right? So some one of these interpretations that I gave you of, of this statement from the Bible may be obvious to someone. Oh yeah, of course it means this. But it's not obvious if you look at the course of history and all the different ways in which it's, it's, uh, it's been interpreted. So we really have to do hermeneutics consciously and we have to understand and select what we're doing. Uh, we have to have proper guidelines for hermeneutics. Otherwise we can end up, you know, everywhere from, yeah, Marx to, um, to, to you know, theology, to history, we can end, we can end up anywhere and we, we won't even know what we're doing. You know, that's very striking what you said. I remember long ago, I read an article in a newspaper from a newspaper and a well-known Indian author. He says, all of India's problems are because India is not following the Bhagavad Gita. Very interesting. I said, I read it. So he, his reading was that if India had followed the Bhagavad Gita within five minutes of the creation of Pakistan, India would have attacked Pakistan and, and annexed it into its own kingdom. Just as Krishna fought against Adharma. And because we did not do it, that's why we have so many problems. So that was his interpretation of applying what applying the Bhagavad Gita means. So it's a, such such a fine example you gave, Prabhu. If if we take it now to our own tradition, the Gita is an excellent example, right? The Bhagavad Gita has been used to preach both nonviolence and to preach violence, both, right? Uh, by, by to stop war and to actively promote a war, and mm -hmm. in the time period during the period of india's independence gandhi was teaching nonviolence nonviolent resistance from gita and others at the same time were using the gita to say no this means we have to fight we have to pick up arms and fight and opposite meanings taken from the same text from the same book from the same passage so you are giving a very good example of this uh, bringing it closer to home. From the Bible, we can now say, okay, the Gita also, uh, depending on, and of course, Srila Prabhupada speaks of this in his introduction to the Gita, how there are so many hundreds of translations of Bhagavad Gita and everyone has their own way of interpreting the Gita or misinterpreting the Gita. And uh, it, it, this is a hermeneutical uh, example, right? It's a hermeneutical problem. Mm. So I... And I'm just thinking about it that if we don't have hermeneutics, then what you talk about Marx, you know, that actually people can then become puppets in the hands of the powerful. Because whoever has power, they may interpret it and they may mandate that interpretation as the right interpretation. And that can lead to people being misled. So... So if there is no hermeneutics, then the idea would become that one person says this is the meaning and that is what everyone has to accept. And if that person is well-intentioned, maybe it is good. But if that person is not well-intentioned, then it could lead to a lot of, of, lot of 
severe consequences. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, uh, there's every chance we will slip into into mis, uh, you know, misinterpretation. The, the, that's that's sort of the default. In order to interpret properly, you have to work very hard uh, yeah. to to interpret according to Siddhanta, uh, according to the to the lines of a Siddhanta given to us by the Acharyas. That takes a lot of work. One has to constantly uh, purify and uh, our intention and understand what is our intention and our interpretation. We have to constantly look very carefully and, and to slip into misinterpretations, there's a thousand ways, right? There's, there's a thousand ways to get it wrong. It's easy. It's, it's easy to just go off in a particular direction. We, we see this in Chaitanya Charitamrita, how Swarup Damodar used to uh, be the, the guard, the hermeneutical guard before <laughs> Chaitanya Charitamrita. Intellectual gatekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you remember the story when, when uh, um, uh, one poet came, I, I'm forgetting his name, he, he came and gave some verse about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath. Yeah, the Bengali and, Vaishnava, that's all he's referred to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so Jagannath is the body and, and, uh, and um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Atma, is the soul. And uh, uh, all the devotees, or not all, but many of them were saying, wah, wah, very nice, very nice, beautiful. And Sarup Damodar heard it and he very st uh, strongly uh, rejected that idea. That, mm -hmm. that you, you don't understand anything about Alankara, you don't understand anything about Rasa. Basically, you don't understand what is the, the appropriate way of interpreting of offering prayers. And so you're giving this novel interpretation uh, and uh, this, is, this is displeasing. And then he explains why it's wrong. So, so there's, a, there's a thousand ways to get it wrong. It's, it's really easy to misinterpret. And if we're not, we're not conscious and properly uh, understanding of what is the hermeneutical principles of our acharyas, what is the hermeneutical principles that Srila Prabhupada has given us, what are the hermeneutical principles of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya? Then, uh, you know, sky is the limit for misinterpretation. Yeah. So, and one of the ways in which you can slip into interpretation is to think that there is no need for interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I was thinking that about uh, the interpretation. In fact, uh, Prabhupada uses the word explanation, but the 61 explanations are Atma Ram words, which Lord Shaitanya Mahaprabhu does. That is clearly at one level interpretation. This word can mean this or this or this. So if we just avoid the negative connotation of the word interpretation, then we see multiple explanations given throughout our tradition. Whether it's Atma Ram verse or there is this Tektva Sudhistija verse in the 11th canto. The same verse refers to Ram, Krishna, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as explained by Chakravarti Thakur. So I think uh, in general, in the domain of rasa, even, even where Putana's pastime is there, in the domain of rasa, having multiple interpretations or multiple explanations seems to be uh, quite acceptable because it's just ways we, we relish, relish different aspects of the Lord and relish different aspects of the um, of his glories. Now, when it comes to something beyond rasa, mm -hmm. so for example, a verse that has a different philosophical meaning or a verse that can have a significantly different practical application. So can we, are we having some examples of that? So basically, before we go into examples, is there some word for hermeneutics in Sanskrit? I know Mimamsa is the Mimamsa has developed a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, I think strategies for interpretation within that. Yes. And yes. Nyaya also Nyaya also had an aspect of logic and how to present things logically. But maybe you could, before we come to the specific Gaudiya tradition, you could talk about the broader Vedic tradition and its own uh, schematics for uh, for hermeneutics. Yeah, so hermeneutics is, is an English word, of course, derived from the Greek word. But uh, hermeneutics is not something that is foreign at all uh, to uh, the Vedic tradition. In fact, a lot of the debates that happen on, uh, on questions uh, be between different sampradayas, for example, all focus on questions of hermeneutics. 
Uh, and we there's multiple words that are used uh, for that purpose. I think mimamsa is a very um, nice general word. Of course, mimamsa refers to a specific uh, tradition of uh, philosophy also. So Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa uh, are there. But in general, Mimamsa referring to uh, uh, detailed inquiry into any subject is a, is a very a nice generic term that one can use for hermeneutical activity. Uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, the, uh, 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 and then as you mentioned in, in traditions of Nyaya and in traditions of Vedanta, all of these have very nice descriptions. Sometimes also uh, what we speak of as hermeneutics is comes in the area of pramana also and understanding uh, what is pramana and uh, epistemology. Mm. So, uh, you know, for, for one, one very nice example of this, this debate in the broader tradition is, for example, in the conversation be between Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and pra both Prakashananda Saraswati and Savabhom Bhattacharya. So, um, uh, the one question is, well, how do you properly interpret uh, the words of Yasadev, of uh, the Vedanta Sutra and uh, the Vedas? And there's a question there, specifically a hermeneutical question. Should you take the direct meaning or should you take the indirect meaning? And Mahaprabhu's point is that first you have to accept the direct meaning. And that's the starting point. And basically only if the direct meaning does not... Um, does not work at all, then we have to look at the indirect meaning. Or if we can fully accept the direct meaning, then we might also add an indirect meaning to it to supplement the direct meaning. But the direct meaning should be our first point of departure. Now, this is a key hermeneutical principle that is common to the Vaishnav traditions. Uh, Ramanujachari also says the same thing, that in the Shastra, there is statements promoting Dvaita and Advaita, Bheda and Abheda, between the, the living being and God, there are statements of unity and there are statements of difference. Both of those statements have to be accepted at face value and have to be accepted fully. And we agree with Ramanujacharya on this point. Whereas, whereas uh, Shankaracharya has a very different hermeneutical principle uh, approach where he says, no, 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 not all statements have equal value. Some statements have overarching strength and value over every other statement. And these statements, he calls the Mahavakyas, like Tattvam Asi, uh, Ekam Eva right? Uh, uh, and all of those Mahavakyas are typically uh, moving towards non-duality, towards oneness, towards impersonalism. So he says those statements have greater power and they will over they will uh, 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 overcome statements uh, about difference that have that must be reinterpreted, that must be explained in terms of the Mahavakyas, in terms of those statements of oneness. And Ramanujacharya comes back and he says, uh -uh. if Shastra is saying X and Shastra is saying Y, then both X and Y have to be properly respected and given the weight that Shastra itself applies to X and Y. And therefore, he comes up with the idea of Vishishtadvaita, that both oneness and difference are important. And of course, we agree with that point in, in uh, Achintya Bheda Bheda as well. So this is an example of how hermeneutics has been at play. I mean, not just at play, it's been the center of debate and argument in the Vedic traditions, in the Vaishnav traditions, in the Orthodox Vedic traditions for, for centuries. Uh, this, is, this has been so important. Uh, it's not some newfangled idea that, you know, uh, certain uh, intellectual devotees are bringing into ISKCON from outside, from Western academia. It's not like that. The word, of course, is new because we're, we're I mean, you and I were speaking in English, so we're using English words. But uh, ISKCON's hermeneutics, uh, Vaishnav hermeneutics, Kodiya Vaishnav hermeneutics, is and must be based on a long, long and very proud, very rich heritage we have of Shastric analysis and interpretation in our own tradition. I cannot tell you how many times the Acharyas, they, they give their commentaries on a verse and then after they give the explanation, they will say, Yadva, uh, but then or else, 
this sentence can mean this. On both matters of rasa and matters of tatwa, both, they'll give different understandings of the same verse, the same statement. Sometimes 61 different explanations, as you mentioned, which were all on tatwa point, right? Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was all speaking on philosophical matters, not on rasa there. Rasa is, is a wonderful playground for uh, the acharyas who are commenting. Uh, they really relish giving different understandings of Krishna's lila. Uh, but also tattva is uh, matters of philosophy. Uh, they show the depth that is there. So then, if we consider that there's such a, as you said, rich and proud heritage we have got of the that there is to be scripture needs to be understood carefully so if, you know, if we consider there are two things there is a road and there are rails to the road so till now i think we discussed the need for a road okay this we need to interpret I, in general what i observed is that maybe prabhupada emphasized the rails more and that is why within within our movement sometimes the idea that the, the rails are what is important and that that has become that has become mainstream and of course both are important so could you explain a little bit why the idea that apart from the prabhupada's hesitation to use the word interpret or not even hesitation you could disapproval but uh, apart from that why is there the idea that there is no need for hermeneutics? Is that also something which is present in every tradition? I remember I was in Texas and I saw a person on the t-shirt, probably was like evangelical Christian or something. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. So, <laughs> and they're putting it very proudly. So, so is it that there are always in every tradition people who just uh, reject the need for hermeneutics. So is it something distinctive to our tradition or is it something, um, our tradition is something distinctive to our movement or is it just a matter of universal religious psychology? Yeah. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful question and issue that you raised, Prabhu. Uh, actually, um, hopefully it's clear by this point why hermeneutics is both necessary and also inevitable. Right, So it's not only necessary, but it's inevitable. Uh, you take that statement, God said it. I, I think the question is, what is it? Right? What is it that God said? And if we take that statement, blessed are the meek, then we can see, well, what, what is it that God said? Well, that's a question, right? So it's inevitable. And even that person who says that there's no need for her hermeneutics has a hermeneutical system in mind. It's just implicit. That's all. It's, it's just assumed. Uh, it's there. It may be under the surface, but it's there. The, the point, however, is that if we're conscious of what are those guidelines, so what you pointed out, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, very nicely, is that we need rail guards for hermeneutics. And this is exactly what hermeneutics is. Right? For, hermeneutics is a system that provides us with two things. One is the boundaries within which explanation, interpretation, et cetera, can take place. Mm. The freedom to make that interpretation, to explore and explain within those boundaries. Uh, let me give you an example. Okay, so, so two things. It gives us the boundaries. And by creating the boundaries, what happens when you create boundaries? You, you basically demarcate a space, right? A safe space. Mm. And as within those boundaries, then you can play, no problem. Just like if, if my children go out to play, then I tell them, I give them clear boundaries. You stay within the yard, within the backyard of the house, right? And there's a fence there. And what is that fence doing? It's giving restrictions, but what is the purpose of the restriction? So that they have a safe space to play. Within, those, within that fence, they can jump and run and tumble as much as they want. No, no problem, without worry. Another example, if say you play tennis, mm -hmm. this example comes from my Guru Maharaj, Hanumat Preshak Swami. 
he likes to give this example. Like if you're playing a game of tennis, uh, then suppose two people are playing tennis and a third person who knows nothing about tennis, uh, he's watching them. And he's at, at some point he, he comes into the court and he says, okay, you guys stop, stop, both of you stop. Let me give you a suggestion. You see this net in the middle? If you take down the net, your life will be much easier. <laughs> but but the, what is the point? The net and the boundaries of the court itself, they create a space where the game can happen. Right? That, that is why a game, the, the boundaries make the game possible, isn't it? Without the, the net and without the boundaries of the court, there's no tennis. So in the same way, hermeneutics, the most important thing about hermeneutics is the boundaries. This is why when Srila Prabhupada emphasizes the rail guards, when he emphasizes the boundaries, that is the most important thing. That's where you have to start. But when you create those boundaries and when you understand what those boundaries are, then it provides you the freedom to play inside those boundaries. And by play, I mean that we hermeneutics gives you the ability to then take what is in Shastra and to apply it in different contexts, in different parts of the world, in different places. You can extend the application, the relevance, the boundaries of Shastra. You can see its relevance much better. And this is what allows our acharyas to do both of these things at the same time and allows us to do it as well. That yes, we can, you know, we can be faithful to the Sampradaya and yet we can practice Krishna consciousness living in the United States like I'm living. Otherwise, if we didn't have, if Prabhupada didn't do that for us, he didn't apply that, that the Vedic teachings in this new context that I'm living in, how could the tradition grow? Mm -hmm. So Hermione does two things. It protects the tradition and it allows it to grow, right? Both of those things hermeneutics does when it's done well. By setting up the right guidelines, we create safety, we protect the tradition, and we prevent us from misinterpretation, committing violence to the scriptures, and it allows us the freedom to, to inspire, to, to help the tradition grow so that it does not become just a museum piece uh, in someone's mm -hmm. closet. That it's always, it's not just a, a, an artifact of history. Yes, 500 years ago, one saint, he said this. No, it's something that is alive. It's relevant to our times today. So just, uh, when you said hermeneutics, uh, say, allows you to practice, say, Krishna consciousness, Bhakti Yoga in America. Can you explain that? Means, uh, if you say Bhakti Yoga, is say, chanting, chanting the holy names, studying yes. the scriptures. So... Why would we need hermeneutics to do that? So, yeah. So, uh, according according to the letter of the law for sannyasis, they should not cross the ocean. They should not wear sewn cloth. Okay. They should not fly in an airplane, right? But Prabhupada, what did he do? He said, no, no, no. That's not the principle. That's just a, uh, that was an application of the principle. What was the principle? Simplicity, austerity. Right? That he should not be living like a king. He should be performing a walking from one place to another. The traditional main mode of conveyance for a sannyasi is to walk. Right, So he said the principle is simplicity. The principle is austerity. But the, the, another, if, the, the overarching principle is that jivera swarupoy krishnera nityadas, that everyone is a servant of Krishna and should have the opportunity to love Krishna. So if I can maintain my austerity and simplicity, while climbing onto an airplane and flying across the sea or getting on a ship and coming to America, then it is okay. It's not a problem. Too many people at that time, we know, they did not have that ability to distinguish between principle and detail. But Prabhupada did. And so he brought Krishna consciousness to the West. And this is why I am a devotee today. You know, sometimes now, because the world has become so interconnected, that uh, we may not realize the, the radicalness of Srila Prabhupada and Bhaktivedanta Thakur in, in actually going to the West. Before I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, I was quite fascinated by science and scientists. 
so i had read the biography of this indian mathematician who won the nobel prize is ramanuj no yes uh, uh, was it ramanujan you are speaking of yeah ramanujan so he was a he was a brahmin and actually when he went he was invited to london to further his math studies and actually he was rejected from his caste at that time he lost his caste so it seems that it was quite a serious principle even for a brahmana what to speak for then for a sanyasi so yes. so prabhupad so now so prabhupad was radical in that sense so prabhupad uh so hermeneutics is not just about say interpretation of scripture but it also applies to it also holds true for application of scripture in terms of mm-hmm. practically how one will what one is when scripture says do this or don't do this what does it mean so that's where it starts having real world consequences yes mm-hmm. yes you you know um the you you mentioned about how prabhupad was so radical one of the things that i appreciate about shri prabhupad so much is that he is he was so conservative and so liberal he was so conservative and so radical at the same time i mean honestly speaking prabhupad is the most conservative person i know I, he he sticks to the principles of krishna consciousness so strictly and so minutely that we have to i mean of all the different gurus who came during that time he's the only one who encouraged his disciples to you know wear dhotis and kurtas and do murti seva no one no one thought of introducing murti seva to non indians because that was like totally you know it was difficult culturally it was so difficult for people who have grown up in in the abrahamic traditions which all reject murti seva prabhupada is the only one who insisted in all the details of the upacharas and gradually he introduced them in in our movement right so he's he's the most conservative and yet the most radical person i know it, it's it, it, he he transformed the tradition in ways that no one could have even dreamed of you know no one could have dreamed of at that time coming to the west and making brahmanas out of uh, out of non indians and giving women such significant roles in his movement right no one no one could have dreamed of that and yet at the same time he was so conservative right so this is why prabhupad's i mean example this is a hermeneutical example is so amazing and so so beautiful is because it, it's you cannot put prabhupad in a box like yes, that I, yes, sorry <laughs> so i the idea that prabhupad was conservative is something which which he himself emphasized quite often and he says you know i'm postman i'm simply giving uh, delivering what was given to me and so the idea that prabhupad was liberal that may come off as a little bit of uh, questionable or discomforting idea for some people so you give the example of prabhupad's engaging women in service and like distribution that is what you are saying as liberal or what was the exact example you are saying uh, uh so uh, these words conservative and liberal in general are problematic right because they yeah. signify political positions and immediately people go into camps so which is why in general i, I don't like to use those words uh so much but rather say that prabhupad was faithful and loyal to tradition at the same time he was willing to adapt and apply it in many many contexts right and and in terms of the adaptation and application everything from crossing the ocean to giving a uh, brahman diksha to those who are uh, not of indian background what to speak of brahman background right of giving women roles of of preaching and 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 public outreach and brahmanical diksha and so many things to women uh in the movement to uh um you know uh making adjustments in terms of diet and food and ashram life i mean so many different areas one nice purport uh which uh, prabhupad gives in chaitanya charitamrita he has this wonderful line where he says the acharya is not stereotyped right and in very it's very clear in that purport he's speaking about himself uh that people criticize that this is this is how an acharya must be but he says an acharya is not stereotyped mm-hmm. so 
Prabhupada, he describes both aspects, both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have found that it's impossible to put Prabhupada in a box. He's like a multifaceted jewel. And everyone appreciates that jewel from a different side. And their, their appreciation of Prabhupada is true, is genuine. Uh, it's, not, it's not actually possible. It's like Krishna entering the, 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 the assembly of the, the wrestling arena. Right? Each one sees Krishna in a different light, in a different way. Some as a beautiful little boy, some as you know, a, a powerful king and ruler. So people appreciate Prabhupada in different ways. And their appreciations are not wrong. Prabhupada has so many different facets and sides to him. <laughs> but I think, I think we're off topic a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important still. You know, yeah. I, had a, I had prepared a schemata for this. What you mentioned yeah. about Prabhupada being resourceful. Can I share that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, please. That would be wonderful. So see, here, I talk about this as the tradition. And this is the contemporary world below. Hmm. So it's a living tradition. The living tradition connects with the past through fidelity and it connects with the present through flexibility. Mm -hmm. So we need both. And you can say in a, in, in a sense, if I move it forward, that what happens is we can say that liberals are more concerned with the flexibility, conservatives are concerned more with the fidelity. And as you said, if there's only fidelity without flexibility, we'll end up with a museum, museum exhibit. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. without fidelity will end up as a fashion trend with an unknown potency so it is when yeah. we, both of them are together fidelity and flexibility that's when we are a living tradition so I think uh, Prabhupada embodies both and in one sense as I like the point that an Acharya does, cannot be stereotyped means he has to You we cannot put one label on the Acharya so So in one sense, Prabhupada did hermeneutics in the way he presented Krishna consciousness, both the philosophy and the practice. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. And, and that's actually, Prabhu, what I want to discuss next is, the, is, the, is, is what are some of the basic guidelines, those guardrails that we spoke mm. about the next, what are those guidelines that, that are born from our own tradition from Srila Prabhupada himself? I think it's to, to it's important to make things from theoretical to make them concrete. Yes. Uh, but I, I I want to say first I really like these two words fidelity and flexibility. I have always thought that uh, you're the the king of language. You know, you you always like you come up with such nice memorable phrases uh, and uh, and ways of thinking, organizing thought. So I, I really appreciate. I think that's something worth remembering. Fidelity and flexibility, both have to be there. And, and hermeneutics, the purpose of hermeneutics is that it is when done well, when done properly, it's supposed to do provide for both fidelity, flexibility, the boundaries and the space to play within the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I want to point to two specific principles that Srila Prabhupada gives us that, that, that are, I think, that he gives us so frequently and commonly. Uh, I think they, they make this point very well. Okay? One of the most uh, fundamental hermeneutical principles that Prabhupada gives us again and again. Uh, Prabhupada's hermeneutics is not just hidden somewhere. He, he explicitly, repeatedly points out what are his hermeneutical principles. One of the most fundamental that we hear again and again is that famous verse, Yasya Deve Para Bhakti Yatha Deve Tathagaro Tasyaite Katita Hyartha Prakashante Mahatmana. That the truths, the meaning of the scriptures, are revealed to one who has full faith, implicit faith, Prabhupada says, in the Lord, and just as much uh, faith in the Lord as also in Guru. Yasadeve para bhakti yatha deve tatha guru. Then all knowledge is revealed, tasyete katitha hyartha prakashante. It's revealed to that person, right? So certain very foundational hermeneutical principles are present within it. Namely, that the, the number one um, guardrails, the boundaries for hermeneutics for us is that hermeneutics must be done within the range given to us 
by Guru Parampara and by our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, right? So, yasya deve paravakti yatha deve tatha guru. So, if that's, that's the first hermeneutical principle, that the range of meanings that we find, that we can find within scripture, the boundaries to those meanings are laid out by Guru Parampara, by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, as as he is presenting it to us, okay, mm. and so we have to work within those boundaries. So me saying that you know Krishna's chariot, Arjuna's chariot represents the five, the horses represent the five senses, and 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 uh, and Arjuna is the is the 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 individual you know person, and Krishna is the conscience, and and the the chariot is the body, and all of that. Th- that that's that's beyond if i if i if i take a purely metaphorical explanation of the gita that is outside the boundaries of what our acharyas permit us to do okay so that's that's the first okay okay that that that's that's an example of the guardrails there's many guardrails many many i mean this is you and i have both spent a long time working on the Shastric Advisory Council working on the hermeneutics project that the GBC has given us. So th- th- there, there, we know that there are many guardrails, but here's like a very common, very fundamental. Now, let me give you an example of a very fundamental hermeneutical principle that allows us to play within those boundaries. And again, by play, I mean application, that we can apply Shastra within different circumstances. So that's the principle of desha, kala, and patra, right? Time, place, and circumstance, or time, place, and audience is another way to take patra. So Prabhupada mentions this principle so many times and describes it as so important that we need to apply the eternal ideas of scripture in particular time, place, and circumstance as is appropriate. And this is how he... uh, uh, is able to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. It right? is by applying those eternal principles of Shastra in a variety of different ways, uh, but within the bounds of what is according to our Siddhanta. So uh, another way of taking this Desha Kala Patna is also um, another expression is this beautiful verse uh, in Bhagavatam where Sutta Goswami says, Yatha Dhitam Yatha Mati, that I'm going to present to all of you sages, what I have learned from Shukadev Goswami, uh, yatha dhitam, as I have learned it. So there's the, th- this is the two, the guardrails and the space within it, right? Yatha dhitam, as I have learned it, uh, the boundary, and yatha mati, as I have uh, understood it, as I have applied it, as I have seen its relevance. So according to my own understanding, um, it is, I'm going to present it. So, this is examples of two hermeneutical principles. One is uh, protect, providing us guardrails, yasya deve para bhakti, and one is providing us with space within those guardrails to apply, to adapt, uh, to create relevancy. Okay, makes sense. So in one sense, uh, what we can say is that these are we may not, within the tradition, call these as hermeneutical principles, but these are all well-known points. So, it's these are basically we are we are revealing what is already there, not just in the tradition, but we are also ex- showing how many of us are already doing it. But we may not just be conscious that it is that we are actually doing hermeneutical work. Yes, we may not call it that. We're even conscious of it. I mean, this, these, both of these principles I gave you, uh, every practically every devotee is conscious of these two points, right? Yasya Devi Parabhakti and Desha Kala Patra. But we may not just call it that. We may not, we may not name it in that way. Hermeneutics is a is a new name. It's a new term. It's mm. a foreign. Term. But the 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 all all that hermeneutics is asking us to do is to dig and to uh, extract those principles which are already there, given to us by Srila Prabhupada and the Vaishnava Acharyas, in terms of what are the proper boundaries 
and what is the resulting space that we have for understanding, explaining Shastra. Okay. Um, so the talk about these principles. Mm. Again, Prabhupada himself has, as I said, not only given, but also applied the principles. So can you give some examples of, say, both these boundaries and spaces, space within the boundaries, as might be relevant for us in, say, we are in the 21st century. Prabhupada is, is not with us 30, 40 years away from him now. So when we are trying to practice and share bhakti, how might we need to use hermeneutics in our applying and sharing of bhakti? Yes. Yes. So, so um, uh, let me outline a few more uh, like um, practical principles okay, sure. uh, that are there. For uh, I, I think this will answer your question as to how we might actually use hermeneutics in our own in our own context, right? And in our own lives. So one, one um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you here two, two really foundational and very practical principles. Uh, the first two that I already gave you, they're, they're very broad and they're like basically the bedrock of everything we do in hermeneutics in our tradition. This Yasya Deve Parabhaktir and Desha Kala yeah. But um, uh, let me give you now some more that are more personal in terms of our daily practice and study and understanding and application of Shastra. So uh, one, one very simple and foundational one is uh, a hermeneutical principle is to read something repeatedly, right? Again and again and again. And not just once through and then to draw conclusions, to read repeatedly and it's in its entirety, okay? So this, uh, by entirety, I mean that we read a statement from Prabhupada or from scripture again and again to understand deeper its meaning. And we read broadly all the statements on that topic that Shastra and Prabhupada have given. Mm -hmm. uh, so why are these two principles so important? When we read uh, repeatedly over and over again, uh, then each time when we read a particular uh, uh, text, any text like Shastra, we read, then we come to that scripture with certain preconceived notions, some preconceptions that come from uh, my own background, for example, that I tend to understand Shastra in this way because I grew up in America or because I'm of Indian background or I have certain preconceptions. When we read scripture, and we read it carefully, those preconceptions are modified. We change as a result. And then we read it again with our new, our broader intelligence. We read it again and we see something fresh in Shastra that we did not see before. Mm. And that further modifies our, our own understanding, our own mental conceptions, right? Our own uh, uh, conditioning. And uh, uh, because we're all conditioned beings, right? So, so we, as, as we then free ourselves from that conditioning, then we again read and we get something more deeply. So over time, uh, in different circumstances and as our um, situation changes, uh, our life situation changes, we read again and again, we get more and more out of scripture. And my favorite example in this regard is, um, is Arjun in, uh, in Bhagavatam, right? He, he, he uh, hears Bhagavad Gita and uh, the first time around and Krishna's instruction is to fight. Uh, mm. And he goes on to fight. He wants to give up the world and go to the forest and be a sadhu, but Krishna says, no, your duty is to fight. So he fights. When Krishna departs this world in first canto Bhagavatam, uh, he's there in front of Maharaj Yudhishthira and he's, he's in deep grief because his dear friend Krishna has left this world. So how does he give himself solace uh, from that grief? He remembers Krishna's teachings in Bhagavad Gita. And as a result of re-reading, it's not actually reading, he's reading in his mind, 
But by rereading Bhagavad Gita, what is the conclusion that Arjun comes to? And Maharaj Yudhishthira? That they must give up the world and go to the forest. Same instruction in different times in their life, in different contexts, completely different results. The first time you wanted to go to the forest, Krishna says, uh uh, misapplication of my teachings. You have to fight. And later on in life, he's ready to fight. Uh, he, he, he is in the world and, and Krishna is, is uh, and, and, the, and the proper un- interpretation of that teaching now is that now you can go to the forest, right? And retire from everything. So rereading is something that is, uh, is crucial because by reading, we change. And when we change, we read again. This is called a hermeneutical circle, okay? A hermeneutical circle means it, it, uh, I, I read carefully and I understand something from the text. As a result, I change. And when I change and I read again, I get new meaning from Shastra. Shastra doesn't change, but I get new meaning from it. And as I get new meaning from it, I change some more. And when I change some more, I get new meaning from Shastra. This is called a hermeneutical circle, right? And it's, it's very, very powerful. This is the system of reading scripture is again and again. Oh. Along with that, not only do you read again and again, but you read all of what uh, you, you read completely, right? You read all of what um, Shastra or Prabhupada has to say about uh, a particular topic rather than taking simply one statement, right? And, and uh, just deploying that. Um, uh, this, this principle is called Samanvaya uh, in Sanskrit. That Samanvaya means that we are able uh, to take everything that is said in Shastra, even when they look so different, and we're able to harmonize it. We're able to see the single intention behind it. Even they say so many different things. Okay. So this is, this is one principle. There's a second one I want to explain, but, but let me pause here. Uh, this is one principle that I wanted to highlight. It's actually two principles hidden in one, to read repeatedly and to read fully, to read completely. Uh, so that, and so many of our, our, our problems in terms of understanding scripture uh, uh, come from like in, in arguments and debates and so on within the society, come from people pulling one quote out of context and taking that as being the, the whole, you know, um, uh, the whole, uh, the, the, the sum, the, the be all and end all of what Shastra or what Prabhupada has to say on this particular topic. Right? Whereas this principle encourages us, no, you have to read everything fully and completely and repeatedly. That is true. So you read fully, read repeatedly. And in, in one sense, they said, like they said, too little, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So quite often, that's what it happened for us also when we study scripture. We know some quotes and we think, this, I know everything now. So I think that read repeatedly, read, hum, read fully also includes the principle of humility. Isn't it that it may be I, just because I know a few quotes doesn't mean I know the essence of scripture I, or I know I don't know the scripture either even essentially or even exhaustively both ways. So to, to two things, two qualities the the, the, the person who is doing hermeneutics has to have, or person who is studying Shastra, two qualities that person has to have. They have to have um, uh, humility, and part of that humility is openness to changing our own selves, right? Uh, so um, humility, I don't understand what is fully there. I don't fully understand what is there in Shastra, that this is something given by the Lord himself. It's revealed. It's something much, much beyond me. And mm-hmm. so I'm just trying to scratch at the surface, right? Like a, like a child trying to reach for the moon. And that is my position. So that humility has to be there. And an openness that because I don't know oh, everything that is there, therefore I may be surprised. I may be changed as a result of reading Shastra. I may go into reading scripture saying, 
this is what scripture says. And I just, all I need to do is do a search in database to find the right quote to support my point. And then you actually do a search and you realize, well, yes, my point is supported, but also my point is denied. My opponent's point is also supported. Uh, maybe it's more complicated. Maybe I, I was taking it too simplistically, right? And so that that openness has to be there. Uh, this is, you know, it's 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 uh, it's uh, it's that that again that point that you know shastra is not stereotype. Uh, that we have to be open to being changed ourselves in the process. So both of those qualities are very important. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So this brings us to one point in hermeneutics. Uh, or which may make people uncomfortable. Uh, do you want to talk about some other principles before I Just one more. Please. Yeah, one more principle I wanted to point out uh, because I think it's very crucial. And that is that uh, context is crucial for understanding, right? We should always pay attention to the context. Now, what does context mean? Uh, one context is simply the statement within uh, the text itself, right? Who is speaking this at what time? So just like when Krishna is, uh, is um, uh, preaching uh, this karma mimamsa philosophy to his father, Nanda Maharaj. So we have to know the context, right? If I take one of Krishna's statements there and I say, give it to someone, say, see, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Krishna says, and here, you should, you should practice this. And I don't tell the person the context in which Krishna made that statement, I can mislead, isn't it? Krishna made that statement in according to the Acharyas as a way to convince his father, but not because that is Siddhanta, that he's, he's using a technique basically to convince his father, not in a Siddhantic. Or I take uh, a Narada Muni statement to Mrigadi, you should kill the animals fully. And I take that as my guiding principle for my life, right? Kill animals. No, that, that would be wrong because I've, I've now ignored the context of the statement. Mm. Speaking to a hunter who was half killing animals. So killing animals fully in that context is good. It's, it's a positive thing, but not in my context, it's not. I should be vegetarian. So understanding the context of a Shastric statements within the, the text itself, within the book itself is, is crucial. But also historical context is also very important to understanding the impact and power of what is being said. Uh, just like the statements in Bhagavatam saying that a brahmachari should wear bark or should wear deer skin, should go like this and live in the forest. So these are all valuable statements, but we have to understand them in the proper context, that these are statements made for an earlier yuga, an earlier age. And today wearing bark skin is not recommended for brahmacharis or vanaprasthas or sannyasis, that if we're in a different context, the principle is still true, that we should be sim simple and austere. Every brahmachari should be simple and austere, not wear lavish clothing. But, but the exact application of it is contextual, right? So, so much in our shastras is, is relevant, is, is better appreciated when we understand the historical context. Bhagavatam, basically, the entire Srimad Bhagavatam is a response to a historical context, isn't it? The, the saints are there uh, in Naimasharanya, and they're worried about the Kali Yuga and what, what's going to happen in this dark age. How are people going to uh, uh, achieve perfection? And Bhagavatam emerges as a result. Krishna, Svadhamo, Bhagate, Dharma, Jnana, Vibhisaha. So Bhagavatam is a response to a historical context. Every avatar descends to earth as a response to a historical context, right? Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chudishkritam. There's a historical context which needs to be addressed. Yada, yada, hi dharmasya glani. Yada, it's when. That's a historical question. When is this happening? The acharya's preaching is always a response to a historical context where he's addressing a particular group of people at a specific time and applying those eternal principles to those specific group of people. Prabhupada's prayers on the Jaladuta, so beautiful. They're a response to the historical context that he is facing. Look at these people, the geographical, the cultural context. These people are overcome with the modes of passion and ignorance. 
my dear Krishna, please make my words suitable for their understanding. What is he asking for? A way to make his words suitable for the cultural, geographical, historical context in which he is operating. So our appreciation for Shastra uh, and for the words of Guru can grow, their impact can grow when we recognize what is the context in which it is being said. And by, by understanding that context, we may come to recognize that this statement that is being made is eternal, it's applicable at all times and all historical contexts. On the other hand, this statement was applicable only to Treta Yuga and is no longer applicable to Kali. By understanding the context, it is possible to recognize the applicability of a particular statement. And I, once again, Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas do this repeatedly in their commentary and writing. Right? But then it would, be, it would be wrong, it would be foolish for us to then take Prabhupada's statements and to also not recognize that, right? To just say, to ignore that, that contextual aspect to Prabhupada's statements. That there are some statements that Srila Prabhupada is saying that are Siddhanta, that are present for all times and all places. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We are his servants. There's no, there's no change over context. And there are other statements that today is a cloudy day that is applicable to a particular time and particular group of people, etc. So many things that he says in his letters, for example, that are contextual instructions for a particular group of people. And it would it would be uh, harmful for us to take them out of context, or at least not to recognize the context that is present there. Mm. This was the, the other principle I wanted to mention, yes. contextual understanding. Yeah, I think this is so critical. Again, the point comes up that some, when, when somebody says there's no need for interpreting, then we may be universalizing the statement, and it would be not just presumptuous, See, we can say on one level, we say it's presumptuous to contextualize scripture or acharya statements, but it, it could be preposterous to universalize them. Say, for example, Prabhupada said, uh, when the Gurukul teachers asked him, How much should children eat? This is two, three chapatis. And if they made it into absolute rule, no child should eat more than three chapatis, and no child should eat less than two chapatis. <laughs> so that would be so you know we can have the, the danger is not just on one side of contextualizing by contextualizing we might minimize but we might uh, by universalizing also we might we might we might misinterpret we might misapply so i think it's important to be aware of dangers on both sides very very well stated Prabhu. i really like that that there's two, it's a double edged sword right universalizing something that is not meant to be universalized is a danger and, and diminishing or minimizing something uh, that is universal and making it narrowly applicable to a, a little context that is also a danger, right? So minimizing and universalizing, both are equally problematic. So now, when we talk about context, I think this brings us back to the uh, earlier point I was making. I was planning to make. So when scripture speaks that a scripture gives universal statements spoken in a particular context. And if we are to say, look at the Prabhupada statements and the previous Acharya statements, even scriptural statements, isn't there a certain level of self-appointed authority to think that I will decide which is universal and I will decide which is context, which is, which is contextual or it's not a self-appointed authority. It's basically a common sense. Prabhupada also said that Krishna consciousness means common sense. So how, how do we, on, again, it means how do you use the boundaries to decide what is contextual? Yeah, I, I think you raise a very crucial question about hermeneutics which is who does hermeneutics, 
right? Who is the who is the appropriate interpreter, explainer, commentator of Shastra? Mm. Mm. And this this is a very crucial question. I mean, if you look at the history of Christianity, the whole Catholic Protestant split, one of the major elements of that split is based on this question that who has the ability to interpret the Bible? Only the priest who is well-educated in the whole history of theology in the church going in their parampara? Or is it every uh, reader of the Bible has the ability to understand it in their own way? And that, that question, I mean, leads, the question of who has adhikara, the word in Sanskrit is adhikara, right? So who has, uh, I mean, this is such a crucial point. It, this, this is practically, I mean, it's what causes splits between traditions, between uh, religions, is just this question of who has adhikara uh, to uh, appreciate and understand scripture, to, to interpret scripture. Uh, and so this, this, is, this question is, is very much important. It's part of the question of boundaries. Our original discussion of boundaries is, is part of that, is that not only what are the boundaries, but who gets to decide what are those boundaries uh, and how big they can be and how much you can play within them, et cetera. So um, that's, that's, that's something that, that I'm very glad you, you brought up because I think it's very important for us to uh, discuss and to unpack. Now, ultimately, the so... Uh, th- th- uh, we can start all the way back, right? And we can say yeah. the first, the Just first going element. Back, sorry, yeah. going back a little bit. I think yeah. here also that two extremes that you mentioned uh, with the Christianity that there's, if only, it's only the priests who can interpret, then I just trying to elaborate this point that then it means that the priests get almost unilateral authority and they can abuse that authority. But then if we say it's just every reader, then we, you know, Protestants have also divided endlessly based on, because they're very, their very foundation doesn't accept authority. So there are almost like 55,000 Protestant denominations. So within our tradition, we have this concept of adhikar. And uh, so is adhikar related with what we talk, what we often talk about is the Kanishtra adhikari, Madhyam adhikari, Uttam adhikari? Or those are words in a different context. Yeah, we can take it like that um, in terms of who has adhikar. Uh, but typically, in the in a in in terms of understanding shastra, the main boundaries of adhikar are are laid out by parampara and then by guru, right? So, within the 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 context of the tradition, when we ask our question, okay, who has the ability to interpret shastra? for me, then typically we say, okay, the first is the spiritual master, right? So for us, it would be Srila Prabhupada, who is universally uh, the primary uh, interpreter of scripture for any devotee who is a member of ISKCON, uh, mm. that uh, he, he provides those boundaries within which we can understand. But of course, Srila Prabhupada is not working in isolation. He said many, many times his is only he said my only credit is that I have not invented something new, right? That I faithfully followed the instructions of my guru Mahal. So he is working within a very uh, prestigious uh, uh, heritage of um, uh, acharyas in our guru parampara who have each uh, served to function in this capacity. Mm-hmm. Now our role in all of this, okay, we have the boundaries the space created for us by Srila Prabhupada. But within that space, then we have to develop our own understanding that is personal to us. We have to appreciate Shastra and make it, we we have to have an individual personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada through his books and through his scriptures. And that means, like I was saying earlier, that Shastra, Prabhupada, they're multifaceted jewel. We'll each understand the jewel in different ways and apply them in our own context, in our different parts of the world and different cultures. And yet we have to still play in the same playground, right? So uh, th- that's that's the challenge that we have before us, uh, that 
that uh, um, you know we 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 have to stay in the same playground because the fences for that playground, Prabhupada has given up for us, and yet we have our different games to play, right? We have our different roles to do, different applications to make in our own, and everyone doesn't have to do exactly the same thing, like some sort of army marching, right? We've we've we have different ways of expressing our Krishna consciousness. And this is what makes the Krishna consciousness movement so beautiful and so powerful is that all over the world, devotees are so creative in the ways that they present Krishna and the ways in which they appreciate Krishna in their own world and in their own context. Those aspects of Krishna that mean a lot towards them. So we have, we can play our own games. We can be creative and so many games are there, but we have to stick in the same playground. Right? That's, that's Prabhupada's playground that he's made for us. By understanding and properly applying hermeneutics, this process becomes easier of staying within the boundaries and yet allowing for creativity and growth within those boundaries. Uh, it becomes easier because we have a common understanding of what the boundaries are. And we have a common understanding of what is the what is the proper way, the, the nicest way to play, right? Well, how should we, how should we engage in conversation, in samvada that is, um, uh, that is kind and generous at the same time very sharp, and uh, and uh, and uh, intelligent. So, so hermeneutics provides us with those tools basically uh, to be able to do that because we have a shared understanding. And unity within a tradition can be maintained to the extent that there's a shared hermeneutics. As soon as there's the hermeneutics diverges, then a tradition splits. If we have a shared understanding of what are the boundaries of interpretation and what is the proper means, method of doing interpretation, then even with diversity, we can get along, right? And we can work together. There can be unity and diversity. And as soon as those hermeneutic principles are, are not shared, the fundamental principles of hermeneutics are not shared, then there's a split, just like we see in the Catholic and Protestant traditions. There are so many instances in the Vedic tradition as well. So we could say that what you talked earlier about Shankaracharya and Ramacharya, that is a foundational hermeneutical disagreement. That what is the, that are all statements of scripture more or less of equal value, or some switch, some statements are of far higher value. Now, with respect to Prabhupada, what you said, you could say this is this is one way of understanding. Prabhupada said, uh, it is said about Prabhupada that he built a house in which the whole world can live. That means we can have uh, we can have intellectual diversity within our movement also. To some extent, we can understand the aspects of say, I would say. Just to put it in the hierarchy, that um, there is practical diversity in the sense of, say, the architecture of temples. That is something which is a very easily understandable fact. That's essential. Mm -hmm. Then, if you, if I take it from above from the practical, each temple may have its own architecture. Each temple may have its own particular way of entering. The way the deities are dressed and decorated, way, way the deities are there in the temple. But beyond practical diversity, there is say cultural diversity, which makes some people a little more uncomfortable. And then we could say intellectual diversity, it makes even more uncomfortable many people. Now it depends for people, for some people, cultural diversity may be more uncomfortable. But in general, uh, intellectual diversity is, uh, is it something which is uh, a practical requirement because we all are of different natures or is it a, a essential aspect of the tradition itself? That means, you know, is it because we are different? So for accommodating us, we have all these different views or is it scripture itself is intrinsically readable in different ways? So is it a, I mean, to put it, is it a concession or is it an inbuilt feature? Yeah. So in ideal world, would we not need hermeneutics at all? If at all we had an ideal world? No, e e even in the spiritual world, hermeneutics is 
is uh, something wonderful because everyone understands Krishna in different ways, isn't it? I mean, uh, the, the example, this was, of course, Krishna's Leela in the material world, but the example we started with of Krishna closing his eyes uh, when drinking milk. So these are all liberated pure devotees who are explaining Krishna's closing of the eyes in different ways, mm. right? If we, go to, if, if we go to Braj, then everyone sees Krishna in a different way. Some see him as Cupid personified and others see him as a sweet little boy uh, who is very charming. Uh, so their conceptions are, are not uh, wrong, right? The, the whole, I mean, if, if Shastra was reducible to a single intellectual stance, then it would not be Shastra anymore. What, where would its value be, right? The reason Shastra is so amazing is because everyone from the Atma Ramas to the conditioned soul is able to read Bhagavatam and gain so much from it for their uh, uh, benefit, their individual benefit, isn't it? So uh, everyone from, from me, a conditioned soul, who is reading and thinking, oh, I have to give up my anarthas, to Atma Ramas Chamunayu Nirgrantha Yapur, who's Nirgrantha, who's yeah. given up all his anarthas already, all of them are benefiting from Shastra, clearly not because they read it exactly the same way, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the don't eat meat is not going to strike the Nirgrantha Atma Rama devotee as, as particularly relishable. It'll be something that's a given. But for me, it may be, oh yeah, I have to be careful with what I eat, right? So uh, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, the, the very nature, the very nature of Shastra is that it is a well that never stops giving water, that never goes dry. Uh, it is a, a gold mine that never empties of gold, right? It is something that is always fresh and always giving more and more and more, regardless of what level we are at and what position we are at. So I would say it's both. It's based on the fact that we are different, but it's also the very nature of reality itself. It's the very nature of who Krishna is. And naturally, therefore, Shastra is that way also. Beautiful. This is how we can say Shastra is a kalpataru, isn't it? Desire fulfilling. Yes. yes. So not just because we are diverse, but Krishna is also unlimited. And I was thinking there are so many instances, see, uh, when Krishna comes in Kamsa's wrestling arena, it's described how different people see him differently. And the Bhagavatam doesn't say these people are wrong and these people are right. They say they are, they are seeing differently. And uh, we understand from a philosophical perspective that some understandings may be higher and some understandings may be not. But uh, it's, it's interesting that when we consider that scripture itself is... So you are in this thing, did you equate scripture with Krishna? You say scripture is like a mind that keeps giving gold. Are you saying that yeah. scripture are not different? You're saying in that sense? Or is it that because we approach we approach from different perspectives. That's why. No, but I'm saying is both. both. Is that the fact that we are at different levels and therefore when we read Shastra, we get different things out of it. That mm -hmm. is point number one. But point number two is also Shastra itself is multifaceted. Uh, because it is, I mean, and by Shastra, I'm referring here to the highest of Shastras, like Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, that is truly Krishna Katha. Then this is Krishna Svadhamo Pagate, Dharma Jnana Pisa. So this is Krishna's avatar in Kali Yuga, is Srimad Bhagavatam. He appears in this form. So therefore, like Krishna, he, he, this, this Bhagavatam will be appreciated in so many different ways by different people, just like Krishna was appreciated by so many. And yes, some understandings may be more elementary and some understandings may be more advanced. Uh, it's not that everything is the same or it's all relative. No, they, there may be differences, but... The point is that it is not incorrect to see, appreciate Shastra in different ways. In fact, it is practically a necessity. Uh, it is inevitable. Oh. So this is... Uh, so now, uh, since uh, maybe we could conclude by talking about... But is there sufficient uh, say education about hermeneutics? Or as a movement... Is it something which uh, 
be neglected or is it the because we are a new movement of course the tradition is very vast but as a institution we are new so we are gradually solidifying that because considering how important hermeneutics is it is uh, it is it is a matter of surprise or concern that so many so few of so few devotees are even aware of it so is it something naturally is it something natural in the new movement and as it evolves it will grow uh, so for example we had this discussion and uh, we also were a part of the shastri karwadi council where we helped to write the paper so as a academic scholar and as also a devotee the lack of hermeneutics uh, knowledge about hermeneutics how do you see it and how, how do you how do you see a change in what is happening so i i think it's just a matter of education uh, the, uh over time um the it's particularly important at this point in the history of our movement this is why the gbc has uh, uh, uh asked for this development of hermeneutics for now many years it's been a decade i think since the very first uh hermeneutics committee was formed by the gbc particularly with concern about the the moment we are in now in the history of this global krishna consciousness movement namely that we are at a point when the generation that was witness to shila prabhupad directly the founder acharya of our movement that and and his his approach to understanding and applying shastra at uh, those people are now growing much older and as a result a lot of the uh intuitive and historical knowledge that these devotees have about prabhupad himself and what he meant in a particular situation when he said it what was the context of that statement uh, so you bring up a statement and some devotee senior devotee will tell you oh yeah prabhupad at that time he was speaking to such and such person and you know what had just happened is he had gotten a letter from uh, and this is why he was saying this they'll immediately tell you the whole context what was the mood at that time who was it that historical knowledge and also that intuitive knowledge that is there of shila prabhupad himself is is in danger of being lost right and when you don't have eye witnesses who are present then one has to have very clear principles in place hermeneutical principles tools qualities need to be in place so that the future fences for the back for the playground and we so so again you're saying that maybe the hermeneutics that was implicit needs to be explicated or articulated so that it is uh, so that uh, it is better understood so yeah yes. i think that's a very important point that many statements especially if we um, look at them in context or as you say we hear from those who were in con- who heard them uh, they can they come off as very different from what they come off in isolation yes. so you see it's a part of a natural growth and it is it's on a healthy trajectory where we are moving forward yes yes it's 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 a very healthy process it's a very natural process also uh and and it, i i don't think people should worry that oh we didn't do this before why are we doing something new now uh because we did do it before it just was implicit and why does it need to be made explicit now when it was implicit in the past because now we are in a unique moment in the development of our movement when all those who are personally present at the founding of the movement are uh, growing older and this is for for people of my generation this is a very um uh a uh, very very risky time right it's a very challenging time most religious traditions encounter their greatest challenges when the first generation leaves oh, so this is not, not just when the founder founder leaves huh? it's in the first generation leaves uh, 
Yeah, founder founder leaves. That's crisis number one. Okay, no no question about it, because the charisma that inspired the entire movement is now gone. And so the question then is, how do you take that charisma, and how do you make it routine? How do you create an institution that can embody the best things about that charisma, even in the absence of a single person who can inspire charismatic. So th that is the first challenge, the first crisis is always the, the departure of the founder. But then the second is naturally there's a whole generation of people who have wisdom, who have authority, who have intuitive knowledge, who have historical context because they were eyewitnesses, right? Because they were the apostles, because they were the, 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 the associates of the leader, the founder, the, the Messiah, whoever it might be in any religious tradition, right? And once they leave, then this is challenge number two, because now you have a whole generation, not a generation, everyone who is there has never been eyewitness to the founder. Mm. That point is very, very, so we might think of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's departure from this world, right? And what that meant to his associates, the grief, the challenge it caused. And then we might think of the generation of Srila Jiva Goswami, where he was faced with the prospect of losing even the associates of Mahaprabhu. And how would the movement go on at that point? This is why he wrote the Shat Sandarbha, right? This is why Chaitanya Charitamrita was written, to lay down. There's so much philosophy in Chaitanya Charitamrita, much more than in other biographies of Mahaprabhu. Because by that point, all of this needed to be written down nicely so that the boundaries, the theology of the tradition was crystal clear for a time when not a single person on this planet would be able to say that they had seen Mahaprabhu with their own eyes. So we're faced with a similar moment in our history, right? With Srila Prabhupada's departure, which was of course, we know a great challenge for the movement, but we've come through quite nicely, right? But then another great challenge coming forward uh, is going to be the time when none of Srila Prabhupada's associates, his eyewitnesses are going to, his, his disciples are going to be there. And it is that eventuality that the GBC and the Vaishnav community is wanting to prepare for. And this is one of those initiatives. So many things have to be done for that, right? But this is one of those initiatives to make sure that the philosophical guardrails are there. Beautiful. So, although it's sobering, it's also uplifting to see even the even the, the developments in our, of our movement in the historical context. And uh, so do you want to speak something concluding about say the hermeneutics paper or the, what, what is the plan? Or should we keep that for a separate podcast with some of the other members of the Shastak Advisory Council? No, I, I think this was a good, this would be a good point to mention just what has been done so far. Uh, thank you for asking about that because um, so I, I've been indicating it already, but at this point, basically the Shastik Advisory Council uh, has put together a, a very nice course on hermeneutics, uh, a basic course that is uh, um, basically focused on three things. The qualities that one needs to do hermeneutics, the Vaishnav qualities, the principles, uh, the key principles of hermeneutics, and the tools that you use to apply those hermeneutics, those hermeneutical principles. So qualities, principles, and tools. And all of these have, have been, are produced after doing a lot of very thorough research uh, into uh, Srila Prabhupada's teachings, his books, into our uh, acharyas, the parampara, into the broader Vaishnav tradition, so that everything is grounded in, in our tradition, in Shastra, uh, uh, every, all these hermeneutical principles and tools. And 
I mean, the entire paper itself is, uh, I don't know, maybe 150 pages, something like that, maybe more. Mm -hmm. it, it's massive. I mean, if you see the amount of hermeneutical thinking that is there in the Vaishnava tradition, it is jaw-dropping. It's amazing. How many tools are there given by great acharyas, given by Prabhupada? I mean, it's really a lot. So none of this is invented. It's, it's really quite amazing. But anyway, uh, that is quite overwhelming. It's there for those who want to dive deep into it. But also we've tried to condense it into uh, a several day course uh, where these are the basic method for how to do hermeneutics is there. Uh, so that as devotees, we are going to face these questions all the time. Sometimes people say, well, you know, if the acharyas have done hermeneutics, why do we need to do it? If Prabhupada has done it, why do we need to do it? Because we are faced with these questions practically every day, right? We have to read and we have to explain and we have to understand. Prabhupada says this, why does he say this? What did he mean when he says this? Uh, there's controversial statements by Srila Prabhupada that we are constantly faced with. There are controversial statements in Shastra that we are faced with. There are controversies that did not exist a hundred years ago, that exist today. There are challenges and new issues and technologies where devotees are asked to say, what are your views on this new technology, on this new medical procedure that did not exist a hundred years ago, right? And we have to give some Shastic understanding. So how do we do this? How do we deal with controversies? How do we apply Shastra to current contexts, current applications? Uh, this, is, this is the heart of what hermeneutics is. And this is why this course has been developed so that we can appreciate what Prabhupada has given and apply it properly. Again, within those boundaries, but with still with space for creativity. So the course is there um, and it's uh, the pilot has been done and it's been revised and now um, hopefully it is going to be offered uh, more broadly um, uh, to different groups of devotees, whoever is interested in this, but especially those who teach Shastra, especially those who are in leadership positions who have to deal with the most difficult questions on a regular basis. For them, it would be especially valuable uh, to study this more deeply. And our idea is that, that the Shastic Advisory Council uh, has hopefully done a lot of the hard work for devotees by mining, by sifting through our um, Vaishnav literature and finding those principles and tools which will be useful uh, to uh, devotees in these ways. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, should I try to summarize? Or maybe like yes. add some more things? And then... No, I add... Okay. So, uh, so today, it is a very important discussion on hermeneutics. First, we discussed what hermeneutics means and why it is essential. So it is basically the understanding, explaining, interpreting, reading. And uh, although Prabhupada uses... Yes, doesn't approve the word interpret, but then he's talk, concerned about misinterpreting. And he also used the word interpret in, in Krishna book. And uh, we need to interpret, uh, when we say what is the need to interpret, that is often because we have unconsciously adopted some frame of interpreting and we think that is a normative one, that is a standard one. So uh, we talked about interpretation and uh, our uh, understanding scripture in various ways. So with respect to Rasa, we have many examples of, say, Krishna's, why Krishna closed his eyes. But you give the example from the Bible of, of how hugely different the same statement can be. So the meek shall inherit the earth. So we had the historical meaning, but before that we had theological meanings. So you talked about the eschatological as well as theological meanings. And then the Marxist meaning and the liberation theology. So Marxist and liberation theology are exactly opposite. So... So we say that in one sense, hermeneutics is really needed even for reading a newspaper, but it's so implicit and two things, the, the consequentiality and the complexity of say scriptural texts because, uh, because of them, hermeneutics needs to be more articulated, more clearly understood and articulated. And then uh, we discussed in the, in our own tradition, say the Bhagavad Gita's explanation is about is the Bhagavad Gita to be literal call for violence? It was used in the Indian struggle both ways. And uh, then he mentioned about how 
you, you mentioned about several principles for doing hermeneutics. So the metaphor we used was of how there is a boundaries and then there is a playground that is created by the boundaries. So the tradition itself gives us the boundaries and just as uh, children have a safe zone to play, so we all have the room for say creative uh, creative explanation or using our intelligence within the boundaries. And just like in a tennis, if you remove that net, there is no game. So the boundaries make the game possible. The rules, the boundaries make the game possible. And then, so we discussed about how this idea of hermeneutics is there. The word might not be there, but the principle is there. So we talk about Mamsa as being a detailed study of a subject, Nyaya as logic. And then of course, Pramana is epistemology, which, which source has how much authority. And then within that, we discussed about the, the contra, um, contradictory hermeneutics of Advaita Vada and Advaita Vada. So of all scriptural statements have, have equal value and need to be properly understood. Or certain statements have paramount value, what, what Shankaracharya said. And then in our tradition also, with the example of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu giving multiple explanations of Atmaram verse, which are example, which is example of, and it is not just Rasik, it's philosophical. So the idea is that when we do hermeneutics, it is it is what enables us to understand scripture. Otherwise, it, it, it is easy to slip into, there are a thousand ways to slip into misunderstanding. And of course, one um, way to is that there's no need, it's self-evident, no need to understand. And then while discussing about the boundaries and the room to play, we discuss certain principles. So think one is read scripture repeatedly, read scripture fully. And before that, Desha Kala Patra, Yatha Mati, Yatha Shuti, Yatha Mati. And then before that, yesterday, we Parabhaktir. And then afterwards, of course, context. I think we discussed that elaborately. How within context, Without context, even a small statement can uh, something which is uh, something which is contextual might be made universal, or sometimes something which is universal might be made reduced down to might be minimized. So we discussed several examples of, of context changes things, and then lastly we discussed about two things: adhikar, who has the right to actually do hermeneutics, and that is defined by the guru parampara for us broadly, and within that. Each of us has our intellectual space and hermeneutics is not, so we give the example of how Prabhupada himself, the Acharya doesn't stick to stereotypes. So the Acharya transcends stereotypes. So we could say Prabhupada was both very conservative and very liberal. Conservative in the sense that he introduced Murti Puja to people whose very culture was against, or equated with idolatry and which is considered to be terrible. At the same time, Prabhupada also was liberal in the sense that he he looked beyond the letter of the law that don't cross the ocean that is meant for purity that don't wear so on clothes for sannyasi that's meant for simplicity and so like that if you consider the essential principle ultimately is elevate people's consciousness and scripture itself responds to context bhagavatam is spoken in a particular context the avatars come in a particular context prabhupada jaldhuda prayers are in a particular context so when we understand this, that uh, that the Guru and the Parampara, we follow them properly, then we get the Adhikar. So we discussed about humility and openness as virtues. And while with that Adhikar, we, we, do, we understand and apply scripture in our space. And then lastly, we discussed about the history of hermeneutics within our moment. It was implicit when we had those who lived with Prabhupada and those who were the first generation followers they could immediately provide the context and nuance statements which might be read in multiple ways. Uh, but now with, uh, with the first generation and coming to its uh, end, this you said is like a crisis number two. Crisis number one for a religious movement would be the charismatic founder departing and the charisma needing to be routinized. But the crisis number two would be the first generation departing and the preparation of the hermeneutics paper with its values, tools, and uh, resources and tools. That is something which is a significant, uh, you could say a landmark, which is now being taught and made available for devotees. And um, overall, as we understand hermeneutics more and more, 
then we can ensure that so we can all live more cooperatively we don't have to insist that uh, we can actually fulfill prabhupada's mandate that live, co- live cooperatively live within the same house so we can say that there will be that, that the intellectual diversity is not just a concession because we are conditioned souls but because it is it is it is integral because we are all individuals and krishna is unlimited so in fact it enhances the beauty of krishna consciousness when we see the uh, we see the both the diversity and the unity together and so a shared hermeneutical understanding is vital for this unity in diversity otherwise the movement will fracture and just how that's how schisms happen in same christianity so who has the adhikar to interpret so is it only the priest or is it every biblical reader so the importance of understanding the importance of hermeneutics and and having a shared shared understanding of hermeneutics is foundational for both our movement as well as for us as individuals in practicing bhakti so anything you would like to add in this conclusion to <laughs> even last time chetan chetan to i was so amazed by your abilities to bring everything together at the end i think you covered it quite thoroughly if someone doesn't watch want to watch the full length of our conversation just this past 5 minutes i think would suffice you did a, such a wonderful uh, overview of everything we discussed so <laughs> thank you for actually the points you made were very striking and uh, i think this is an important discussion for everyone so thank you very much for sparing your time and sharing your both wisdom as well as your realizations and look forward to having you again in the near future thank, thank you, you. you. i i always appreciate my time with you and conversations are always so enjoyable and effortless so it doesn't feel like all this time has passed it just feels like it was a good conversation so i i really appreciate uh, the spirit in which you do these and thank you so much for having me again on this podcast i really appreciate it. thank you very much hari krishna hari